Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Strength to Strength, and you um, folks from Oregon, God bless you for getting up at three o'clock in the morning or earlier to join us here. Um, thank you all for joining us. I know it is early on a Saturday morning, but I believe we're in for um, a real blessing. We have Brother Seth Matson here with us. Um, he's here in Boston at the time. I've gotten to know Seth over the last um, six months. Uh, he sits down the down the study hall from me a little bit, and um, I have to say, I've never met anyone that can study for so many hours straight. Um, he's a very hardworking, diligent man, and I've really appreciated getting to know Seth here um, for the man of God that he is. So I'm really I'm looking forward to what Seth has to say here this morning. Um, so uh, actually, let's let's have a prayer and um we'll get seth to give us a little introduction on himself and a little bit of his background and we'll begin all right let's pray heavenly father we bow in your presence here this morning and i'm so grateful that you are our father and that you are listening and you care and that you've provided a way for us to come to the throne of grace through the blood of christ our risen lord and savior and king we thank you that you have um, given us communities of believers to dwell in here, to live out our faith, and to bring the kingdom of heaven into this dark and evil world. Uh, I thank you for the brothers who have joined us here this morning. Bless each one. I pray a blessing for uh, Brother Seth as he shares from the scriptures to us from the Sermon on the Mount. Lord, pray that you would give him wisdom, um, give him clarity of thought, and may each one of us be um, moved to serve you in a more compassionate and thoughtful way because of this talk this morning. May your name be praised in everything that is said, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Brother Seth, if you could um, give us a little introduction and go ahead with your talk. Thanks, brother. It is really good to be with you all this morning. It is a great privilege to be able to speak about God's word and speak about the teachings of our king. Um, I am 26, year old, 26 years old. I'm originally from Houston, Texas. The last nine months, I've been out in Boston. I'm a student at Sattler College in their certificate program, and I'm also engaged to a gal here named Chloe, and we are, we're getting married in less than a month, um, as I mentioned earlier. And I'm a member of Followers of the Way here in Boston. I Professionally, I am in medical school. Um, so I have one year medical school left, and then I will apply to residency. I'm planning on specializing in psychiatry. So I, I have a particular passion around mental health issues particularly when it comes to caring for those who don't have access. Um, and then I'm also very interested in this intersection between our Christian faith and mental health issues and psychology. And that is a little bit about what I'm going to be speaking about today. Biblical counseling, what does the Sermon on the Mount have to offer to this discussion? As a general outline for the day, first I'm going to introduce a case example, something that we could po possibly all relate to um, that could help us understand what counseling is, particularly in the context of our local churches. Then I'm going to define some key terms, and then we'll jump straight into the Sermon on the Mount and talk about three dimensions of Christ's teachings in the Sermon on the Mount. And then lastly, we'll offer some resources and have some discussion. It is participation that I really appreciate throughout this as we go back and forth. I really would I just value your input as we talk through a few questions to, to create dialogue. Here's a surprisingly common scenario that perhaps you have found yourself in in the past. So Mr. J is a 45-year-old man who attends your church. He has been struggling for the past few months 
feeling disconnected from God and his family. Five months ago, his wife had a miscarriage. He tells you that his relationship with her has been strained ever since, and he doesn't know why. They are constantly irritable with each other. He also confesses that he has been failing in the area of sexual temptation, an issue he had not previously struggled with for years. He wants to get out of this downward spiral and needs your help. This is a moment for interaction. What are some questions that you would ask Mr. J if he was a brother who came to you in the church? We'd love to hear your thoughts. Maybe, uh, Seth, maybe uh, I would want to find out how his relationship with God is. Like, is he finding time for prayer and in the word? And even it says he attends your church. Yeah, like um, church participation. Like, have you been joining in to the, to the work of the church? Um, you know, would be some, some, some questions that, I, that I'd think of. Good. So you, you would want to focus on how his spiritual life is through his, his disciplines, like prayer, the scripture, and then also his communal life with the brothers. Good. Any other thoughts? Okay, we'll go ahead and move on, Brian. That that is a great starting place, and hold on to those questions because we'll come back to both of those topics. First, I want to define key terms. So, what is psychology? Psychology within the Christian community is a is a word with a lot of baggage. Perhaps um, it's a loaded word. What is it when we hear psychology? Is this another worldview that's coming in? Um, is this another way of of seeing others that we can um, perhaps adopt or perhaps we should move away from? Um, and so there's, there's when people hear the word psychology, many different things come to mind. When I use the word psychology throughout this talk, I'm going to simply use it in terms of the study of how the mind and emotions affect behavior. It's a very simple definition. The mind or the way that we think and our emotions or the way that we feel and then how those the, the constant interplay between our thoughts and between our emotions affects our behavior. Here's a schematic that shows our, our thoughts and how they affect our feelings and then affect the way that we live. Um, and that's also affected by the situations that we find ourselves in. You know, a great example of this is every morning that you wake up, especially this morning, if you woke up in Eugene, Oregon, and it's 3 a.m., you, you, you woke up and you thought to yourself, wow, I have a long day ahead of me. Um, when you started thinking about your to-do list, um, perhaps you started feeling a little bit tired and um, you, you needed a little bit of energy boost. And so you decided your behavior was to go make a cup of coffee. Um, and so your, your thoughts of you know, thinking about the day and then your feelings of being a little bit tired led to your behavior. And so that's a psychological perspective of the process of, of someone deciding to make coffee. So it's a very, very simple definition that we'll be, we'll be using here. You know, as, as a more serious example, um, how would we talk about Mr. J in his case that we, we just mentioned in terms of this schematic of thoughts, feelings, and behavior? You know, perhaps the thought that he's having is that the world and God are against him. Um, you know, he had the miscarriage recently and the marital strife, his, his thought processes are um, negative and even catastrophic at times in the way that he's viewing God and viewing his relationships. Um, because of these thoughts, perhaps he's feeling discouraged and sad, even frustrated. Um, and that could lead to certain behaviors, certain irritabilities with his wife, um, where he's moving away from her and avoiding her. Um, perhaps he's in the area of sexual temptation. He's watching pornographic material to, to numb the way he feels, the, this frustration and discouragement that he feels. And from this psychological perspective, a psychologist who is a, a trained professional in the science of psychology would think about Mr. J's case in a very specific way. You know, 
the thought processes, you would try to really, as a psychologist, tackle those thoughts and say, you know, is the last six months really as bad as you're thinking? Or is there another way to think about it? When it comes to that discouragement that he's feeling, the psychologist would want to focus on emotional regulation, maybe meditation or breathing techniques that you know, yes, these feelings and these thoughts are here, but how can we control them and not let them lead to a negative behavior? And lastly, a psychologist will, um, if they want to take a behavioral approach, will say, hey, instead of in the area of sexual temptation, watching pornography, how about going to the gym or um, going to spend time with your children instead or going to journal uh, the way that you feel and the, what you're thinking? And so a psychologist will tackle each, each dynamic of Mr. J's case, perhaps from a different angle. Um, an example of a psychologist, here's, here's Jordan Peterson. He's very popular today, and he is a, a clinical psychologist. And so if you were to, if Mr. J were to go to Jordan Peterson and his clinical practice, those are some of the questions and the thoughts that, that he would have him think through to help him get past what he's struggling with. So that's psychology. But what about Christian psychology? This is the study of the same thing, the mind, the emotions, and the behavior, but from a uniquely Christian perspective. Christian psychology would be the same in many ways, um, but, and there's a wide spectrum of how Christian psychology is practiced. Some Christian psychologists say, wow, the, what we know from modern psychology is rich and powerful and we can use it. And so they'll want to integrate a lot of um, psychological principles into the way that they counsel others. Um, but on the other end of the spectrum, there's Christian psychologists who say, no, we, we're going to, our starting place is going to be scripture. And then we're going to look back at the other psycholo psychological views and see what we can take from them. But our starting place will always be script scripture. So you have a full spectrum um, and we're not going to go into many of those details here. But if Mr. J was to go to a Christian psychologist, how would they think about his last six months? And it would be very similar to the psychologist, but perhaps they would think more about the root issue from a Christian perspective. They would say, you know, this last six months, you've been through some horrible things um, with the miscarriage and the difficulties you're having in your relationships. But where has God been in the midst of this? How can you think about who God is? As far as your feelings, these are legitimate feelings that you have, but how can you focus on experiencing God's love for you? And then when it comes to behavior, perhaps a better way to channel your discouragement is actually move towards your wife and serve her, even when it is difficult. And so you can see how you still think of thoughts and feelings and behavior in a similar pattern, but from a, a Christian perspective. Many of you might know who, who this is on the screen. This is James Dobson. He is um, perhaps one of the foremost thought leaders in the camp of Christian psychology. Um, he's the founder of the Focus on the Family, and he's written extensively on different mood issues, different um, relational things when it comes to child rearing, marriage, um, from a Christian perspective. But he also has a training as a, as a doctor in psychology. And so he's someone that integrates both those worldviews to create literature that is extremely popular today in the church. So that's psychology and that's Christian, Christian psychology. And then there's the camp of biblical counseling, which is unique from the other two. And to understand biblical counseling, we have to understand the historical context from which the modern biblical counseling movement came out of. In the 1950s, uh, Protestants and particularly evangelicals, it, the evangelical movement began to take America by storm. Prior to the 1950s, there was a, a chasm between more of the fundamentalist wing and then the mainline wing of Christianity. Um, the, the mainline wing would have said, you know, scripture is a good story that we can take part of, but they would... there there's less focus on the miraculous and the transcendent. And so the fundamentalists said, no, we, 
we scripture is God's word and it is what we live our life on. And so there was a, they, they said, we don't, we don't want to engage anymore. We want to move away actually from, um, from the discussion when it comes to things like integrating psychology and Christianity. And so there was a, a, a wide chasm um, in the early 1900s, especially the 40s and the 50s. However, in the late 50s, when the, with the rise of the evangelical movement, there were key figures who said, okay, we want to engage with modern culture. We want to engage with modern academic views on the world. We want to engage with modern views of psychology. And so a, a, key, a few key figures, one is Clyde Naramore. Um, in, the, in 1960, he wrote a, a book that integrated a Christian view to therapy, with, which, which held a very high view of scripture, but also integrated it with the view of therapy from Carl Rogers, who was a, a, a famous psychologist who really focused on empathy and compassionate listening in the counseling relationship. And so there was just oh, many resources and people that got excited about this. There were seminaries that were started that um, offered Christian psychology. There were foundations that were formed, such as the AACC, um, which is an association for Christian counselors, which is um, still a large organization today, and in fact, growing. But as you can imagine, you know, Christian psychology, it, as we said, it integrates modern psychology with Christianity. This begs the question, though, how much integration? You know, where is our starting place as Christians? And this was a question, you know, asking how much of this psychological viewpoint should we bring into Christianity? And is it watering down Christianity? Is it, are we, instead of viewing something as a sin that we have a choice in, are we viewing it as a manifestation of some childhood conflict that hasn't been resolved. And so there were, there were many Christians who were thinking about this, and, and you can imagine this, this conflict and this turmoil that came in the movement, particularly in the 70s. In 1970, there's a gentleman named Jay Adams. He was a Reformed Presbyterian, and he came along and he said, enough is enough, that this integration is going too far, and we need to, as Christians, return to scripture as enough for our counseling needs. He, he, his seminal work in 1970 was called Competent to Counsel, and this was a book where he said, the local pastor is competent to counsel. He is competent to shepherd his flock. He doesn't need to send people to therapists. He doesn't need to send people to uh, Psychologist, he said, no, we, we can take care of these needs in the church. He saw the Freudian and the Rogerian integration as weakening scripture, leading to the elevation of secular worldviews. And he was a very bombastic and dogmatic person. And so he, he led a movement called Nuthetic Counseling, which meant to admonish. Um, he, he partnered with Westminster and started an organization called CCEF, where they began training pastors and putting out resources. And today, biblical counseling has many flavors, still rooted in a lot of Jay Adams' early thought. Um, the, the movement has shifted a little bit to integrate some modern psychology, but they still maintain that original sentiment of Adams, that the pastors are competent to counsel with the scriptures. In a definition of biblical counseling, brought out by Jay Adams, is that he said, biblical counseling is discipleship primarily through the complex problems of, quote, our everyday life. And so what is unique about biblical counseling from Christian psychology um, is that the starting place is scripture and the ending place is scripture, and it's scripture all the way through. Um, he, he said, you know, we can think about modern psychology and some of the observations that they make, but we don't want to make any leaps to the conclusions that modern psychology makes. And, and he was, as you can imagine, a controversial figure. Many of the Christian psychologists even said, you know, you're being too dogmatic and you're not um, realizing that there's all truth is God truths and we can integrate these truths. And so there was many different wings and, and schisms that came out of this and tension points. But his definition is very important though. And it's something that we can learn from today that 
Biblical counseling is discipleship, meaning it is for the person in the church, the Christian, and is in the same way you disciple through um, disciple through relational issues that perhaps aren't as complex. You disciple disciple someone through um, purity and overcoming sin. Discipleship in biblical counseling is just for those complex problems of what he called quote everyday life. And so how would how would Jay Adams think about Mr. Jay's case? Well, his thoughts, he would say, you know, take them captive. You don't, you don't need to be enslaved to these thoughts. For his feelings, you know, he would say, turn to the Psalms in prayer. In his behavior, he would call him. He'd say, no, you can repent and turn and change and find new life in Christ. And so you can see how that's different from the Christian psychology. And here's a picture of Jay Adams. One key that I want to make sure I drive home here is that biblical counseling is for the problems of everyday life. Quote, this is a, a term that Jay Adams used because he recognized that there were um, e extremes of mental illness that needed addressing by more, by more professionals. And I think a great way to think about this is if you imagine these two lines here, this is the course of your life from left to right. Imagine this is a timeline, and in between those lines is your life. And then here you, you see the ebbs and flows of normal life. The highs here being perhaps you, you get married, or you have a child, or you get a new job, or make um, some advancement that you've been really looking forward to. There's a lot of highs in life that give us much joy. But then there's lows in life, perhaps losing a loved one um, or losing your job. There's, there's different problems that, that we all face. However, these are the normal ebbs and flows of, and, and what I would call the problems of everyday life. But what about outside of these, this, this norm and these extremes here? These extremes of the human experience when they cause functional impairment, meaning when, when the, the problems of everyday life all of a sudden become things that prevent you from working, prevent you from being able to interact with your family, prevent you from doing the things that you normally do, then it becomes a clinical mental illness. And, and a great example of this is clinical depression. Uh, Last November, Verlin Yoder uh, shared on Strength to Strength about his journey with facing clinical depression. And this, his experience would have been in this deep range, right outside of the norms of, quote, everyday life. And, you know, another great example of this is King David in the Psalms. He said that the ropes of death entangled me. And in many of the Psalms, he cried out day and night, yet he said, I, he's not hearing anything from God. God, why have you forsaken me? And, and when I read this from, um, from my background, I, I say, wow, David, he's, he's crying out. He's doing the best he can, but he feels nothing. He feels like he can't go on. Um, and this, it starts to make me think, wow, perhaps David suffered with clinical depression. If it's, it's not just a, a few gloomy days, but it's consistent despair and lack of hope. And these extreme ranges, they happen. Uh, your clinical mental illness is not a bad thing. It doesn't mean you are weak. It doesn't mean you're sinful. And it's a part of many people's lives. But the key is that, that I want to drive home is that biblical counseling and the way we're talking about is for these problems of everyday life. But clinical mental illness requires the help of a professional, either a psychiatrist or a psychologist who has, um, is a trained professional in diagnosing and treating these, these more severe mental illness. And professional mental health workers are not in competition with biblical counseling and the church. In, in fact, they work in tandem if done well. Um, the pastor can still counsel and exhort and disciple his, his flock, um, but in the psychologist or psychiatrist can take care of those extremes um, through either medication or therapy. And they can work in synergy and they don't have to be pitted against one another as, as many times they are. So more on biblical counseling. Biblical counseling 
it must start with the end in mind. And so the key question in all of counseling is, what is the end goal? And if we have that end goal in mind, okay, what does it take to get there? Our end goal as Christians is Christ himself. That is our end goal. And so when we counsel others, we should keep him in mind. But this still begs the question then, you know, what does it take to get to Christ, to walk in his ways, to know him, to remain in him? This is all this schematic here of from where we are to who Christ is and what does it take to get there is also a helpful way to think about discipleship. Um, but again, biblical counseling being more for those complex issues in life. All of this begs the question then, if who is Christ and how did he live? If we're going to counsel others through their uh, difficulties towards Christ, what does that actually look like? A few weeks ago, John D. gave a talk on Christ and the new humanity. And he, he talked extensively about the individual person being a body, soul, and spirit. And I, I want to refer to that discussion so you can go back and, and watch that because it, it has a lot of deep insight. And he goes into detail that I don't have time for today, but it is a, it's a great resource. Christ, there were, I'm going to make the case that there are three core dimensions of the life of Christ. And we can see all those dimensions through the Sermon on the Mount. First, Christ was an individual. He had a body. He, he slept, he ate, he cried, he mourned, he suffered, he was tortured, all in a physical body. He had a soul, his mind, his emotions, his will. You know, he had a mind that constantly thought of heavenly things. Our Lord had a wide range of emotions, from the joy of seeing his creation healed to the depths of despair. Um, even sweating drops of blood. He also had a will that he constantly surrendered to his father. And his spirit, which was invigorated by the Holy Spirit, by which he was lived as a son of the living God. And so Jesus Christ was an individual in all these senses, in all the senses that we are individuals. He was God incarnate. But beyond just the individual aspect of who Christ was, He also lived in community. He had 12 disciples. He called them his friends. He was, he was both loved by them and abandoned by them at the end of his life. I mean, he had a family. He, there was crowds that followed him. He had many enemies. And so, yes, he had a body, soul, and spirit, but he was also a body. He was interacting with other body, souls, and spirits in the context of a community. And so here we have the individual and we have the communal aspect. Lastly, the third, the third dimension of Christ's life is the heavenly or the God word. He lived his life abiding in his heavenly father's love. The gospel of John portrays this aspect of Jesus. Or continually, Jesus says, I do nothing of my own accord. Everything I do is because I saw the father do. Everything I say, it's because I heard from the father. And so, if Christ lived as an individual, in a community, and in relationship with his heavenly Father, the question becomes, how did he do this? Did he leave us, did he just live this life and then leave us without knowing? No, he, he told us. And, and he told us, how does, what does it take to get there? And the answer is the Sermon on the Mount. In the Sermon on the Mount, we, we have, it's the key that unlocks the life of Christ. And this, if we keep this in mind, Christ as our end with the Sermon on the Mount as the means to get there, this creates a Christocentric biblical counseling. Many in Protestantism and much of what informed the modern biblical counseling movement, including Jay Adams' counseling framework, has a very high view of what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross, the salvation that he brought about. And this is 
a core aspect of the life of Christ. However, what's often not talked about as much is the way of life that he he taught and he lived. That he actually brought about not just a pathway that we could get to heaven and and believe in believe in his name so that we can one day go to a place, but he actually came and lived and taught a way of life by which we could take part of. Then we could become the new humanity with him. So, so often, uh, again, there's two dynamics of Christocentric biblical counseling. There's the salvation that he brings about, which is often emphasized, but there's also the fact that he brought about a way of life. So you may be asking, like, the Sermon on the Mount and, and counseling, like, yeah, sure, um, that's great. What does that actually mean? Why the Sermon on the Mount? You know, many people view the Sermon on the Mount as a very high bar. It's these extremely difficult commandments that shows us how sinful we are. And it stops there. The, it, it's a teaching that, man, it, it just shows how much I, I just need to trust Jesus all the more. Um, and that's an aspect of the Sermon Out, but if it stops there, it stops from the fact that he came and taught. It, it, this is the crown jewel of Christ's teachings. And he not only spoke these words, but he lived them. And to show that these aren't just words that are supposed to show us how, how fallen we are and show us how much we need him, to show him, to show us that these are words that are our life, and these are words that we can accomplish through him. These are teachings that we can live out because Jesus says at the very end, in, at the end of Matthew 7, that anyone who hears his words and does them builds his life on the rock. When the, rain, when the rains come and the flood comes and beat against his house, it will stand because it is founded on the rock. And he contrasts that with the sand of ignoring those teachings. And so if the Sermon on the Mount is this, is what Christ says it is, then it should be what we primarily look to to tackle our problems of everyday life. You know, my fear on the Protestant side, um, from my background, is that the Sermon on the Mount is ignored because of the, the theological system that minimizes Christ as king, but elevates him as, as savior. But my, I also have a fear that people have that come from more of an Anabaptist perspective. I think it's easy to fall into the trap of being Sermon on the Mount people and embracing truths such as non-resistance and not resisting your enemy, but if it remains there and it doesn't trickle down to our everyday life, um, then we're missing something. And like I mentioned, there's three dimensions of Christ in the Sermon on the Mount. And we're going to go into, I'm going to go and break down each individual one, and then we're going to apply them to Mr. J's case. There's the individual that is found in the personal virtue, the kingdom ethics of the Beatitudes. There's also the communal, and these are the, the horizontal dyna dynamics of living as an individual, but within a social communal sphere. And then there's the God word, and this is the vertical dynamics of living as the son of the father. These three dimensions are by no means comprehensive, but they are the pillars, I would say, of the Sermon on the Mount. First, the individual. So much of counseling often focus on it, focuses on getting rid of sinful patterns. You know, we, we, these patterns of thought, these patterns of action, you know, and it, it becomes, the Christian life can become like this game of whack-a-mole where you're just like hitting, hitting these things that come up and hoping that, hoping that you have enough energy to, to keep them all down. Um, and then you might just white knuckle your way through, right? But if we keep, if we limit, the Christian life to that, and then we limit counseling to this, we're missing the question of what am I moving towards? Not just what am I moving away from? Yes, I'm saved from sin, but what am I saved for? And that something that we're saved for is these kingdom virtues. It's not just behavioral modification that these Beatitudes show in Matthew 5, cha Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 through 11. But it is in, in cultivating an inward life. As Spurgeon calls the Beatitudes, it is the ladder of light. Each Beatitude is a rung of a ladder that we can climb up to 
and walk in the light of God's glory as Christ did. Again, I want to reference John D. Martin's recent talk on the new humanity to, for a, a deeper look at these Beatitudes. When it comes to these Beatitudes and counseling specifically, we should ask the question, how would this apply to Mr. J's case? I want to open it up here and, and ask you all, how would the Beatitudes and how would you, as a brother of Mr. J, point him to the Beatitudes to help him through this situation? Are there any thoughts? I think to begin with, um, thinking about the first beatitude, it's, I would probably suggest that he spend a time of reflection on poverty of spirit and um, considering, you know, is there anything in my life to mourn over and go down through? Um, but I see the beatitudes as a a place to start with reflecting on where we are in our own mind and hearts. So I'd probably encourage him to do that. Thanks, Brother Sam. That is wise words that you just spoke. Mr. J is struggling, right? And so where do you start? It, it, there's many different, you know, is it the sexual temptation that he's facing, the marital dynamics, he's feeling disconnected from God. But as Brother Sam just mentioned, the entrance into the kingdom, those who have the kingdom of heaven are those who are poor in spirit. And what does that mean? And what does that mean for Mr. J? Well, we, when we look to scripture, we, we see many examples of being poor in spirit. We see Isaiah when he is confronted with the living God. He says, depart from me, for I am a man of unclean lips. We see King David. He is poor in spirit. And in Psalm 51, when he is crying out in repentance. For God's mercy after committing adultery and murder. In the New Testament, we see Peter when he's confronted with, with Christ, he says, depart from me for I'm a sinful man. And so we see when, when men and women come into contact with God in the scriptures, that those who accomplish great things, that those are who really know God and walk with him are those who are truly poor in spirit. They, they say, I can do nothing on my own accord. They're at the end of themselves. And a part of being poor in spirit, it, it requires a gut honesty with both yourself and with God. And it is surprisingly difficult, actually extremely difficult to be honest with ourselves and with God. To really get to the point where we say, you know, I've exhausted all other options and, and God, I want to come to you and I'm going to start afresh. And this doesn't have to be a shameful thing. Like, Mr. J, you haven't, you haven't been poor in spirit. This is a hopeful message. This is that it says, no, that, that you don't need to bring yourself. You don't need to, you can ask Mr. J, hey, life isn't working right now, but what are you trying? What, what are you trying right now to, to get yourself out? And, and is it working? And Mr. J will tell you, I guarantee he'll tell you, well, I've tried this, I tried this, uh, but it's not working. It's not helping. And so to offer, hey, that, to be poor in spirit, to come to the end of yourself, that is, that is the start. That's the first rung of the ladder. And that's actually a very hopeful message for someone. It doesn't have to be shaming to say, oh, you're not poor in spirit. But, it, but it, it's a call to come and, and not bring anything of your own accord, but just to say, God, I, I need you. And I, I want to start up this rung, this ladder of light with you. Um, Brother Sam, you also mentioned mourning. I am convinced that the first two Beatitudes, being poor in spirit and mourning, if, if we don't get those two down as individuals, then the rest of the Beatitudes um, become things that we can try to grab onto, 
But those first two are the, the soil with which the others spring out of. And, and okay, so why do I say that? We, we talked about being poor in spirit, but what about if, if for mourning? Did Mr. J allow himself to mourn after the horrible loss and the miscarriage? If he did not mourn and, and really feel the weight of, of sin in the world and brokenness, perhaps he, he just moved on. Perhaps there was some bitterness towards, towards God and maybe, maybe even frustration with himself. Like, ah, why didn't I do enough? What did I, what did I miss here? What did I do wrong? But, but to mourn, it's to, it's to mourn the, just the weight of brokenness and sin in the world. After one is poor in spirit, you, you say, you come, I, I, you know, I want nothing of my own accord. I want to come to you. And then to truly mourn not both what the, the sin and the struggles in your own life and your own heart, but also that you see around you, that he's, that he's seen in his marriage and, and this miscarriage. It's a horrible thing that God never intended. And for him to mourn, is to sit with that and say, you know, this is broken. This is not right. Because those who mourn are truly comforted. And the reason why those two are the first two rungs of the ladder is because to move on to meekness. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That is a radical message. The world says, no, blessed are the, are the strong. Blessed are the, the go-getters. Blessed are the... Um, Blessed are the those who fight and 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 gather all the resources and leverage everything they got. Blessed are those because you know they they'll inherit the earth. But no, Jesus says, "Blessed are the meek." And the only way to truly be meek and have that that temperament that Jesus had of love and warmth and um, meekness that he lived his life with. In order to do that, we must first be poor in spirit, and we must first mourn. When we feel the weight of sin, we recognize, man, the only way to really confront this world is with meekness. It's not through being harsh or bitter, but it's that meekness of spirit by which we can see the world in its brokenness. But then we begin to see what God is doing. We begin to hunger and thirst after righteousness. We, we begin to be merciful. So all these other positive aspects of, this, of, the, of the Beatitudes start with those two rungs of the ladder. And so uh, I appreciate you, Brother Sam, for bringing those two out. And so this could be a starting place, like we said, for Mr. J. Come in, asking Mr. J, you know, what have you tried so far? Is it working? He'll tell you no. And then offer him the hope of being someone who is poor in spirit and coming at the end of themselves to God to receive from him his life. And then you can mourn. You can say, yeah, you can agree with God and say, yes, this is broken. So this could be a starting place for applying the Beatitudes to Mr. J. There's also the communal or the social, uh, what I like to say is the horizontal aspect of the Sermon on the Mount. As we mentioned earlier, Christ was a relational person. He had disciples and community. And he taught, how do we live in community? How do we live with others? Primarily in Matthew chapter 5 and 7, he talks about anger. Not being anger, but then he, he cuts to the heart. He says, anyone who hates his brother... Not just, if you, not just if you murder someone, is it wrong? But if you hate your brother, if you even say you fool to a brother, he, he's cutting to the heart with these teachings. He, he's, but he's not just condemning. He's, offering, he's showing the way by which we reconcile, by which we forgive others, by which we love our enemies. He talks about lust and adultery, divorce and remarriage, giving, judging others, and not judging others about loving your neighbor as yourself. And in Matthew chapter seven, he talks pretty extensively about, you know, who are the people we should model our life after? Who are those people that are in the kingdom? And he, he actually gives us litmus tests by which we can, we can know who we, should, who we should be in relationship with in our churches. And if you think of counseling needs that you've come to personally, um, perhaps it's even in your family, your own life, think about how much of it, dealt with anger or lust or perhaps marital conflict. Maybe there's enemies that you faced. How did you interact with them? Um, 
what what, it, what does it what does it mean for you to not judge others, but to look at the the plank in your own eye, or looking at the speck in a brother's? These, if we really grasp these, it these teachings trickle down to every aspect of life. Yeah, and. I think everyone can here as a good example could think of someone who's who who wasn't able to forgive another person who wronged them. And you've probably seen the ripple effect of how bitterness takes root and it has a detrimental effect on every aspect of life. But how does this these teachings in Matthew 5 and 7 about how to live in community, how do they apply to Mr. J? For sake of time, I won't take questions here. We'll just keep moving on. But one of the keys he, here, he says that they are him and his wife are constantly irritable with each other. So a question you could ask is, hey, what do you mean by irritable? Perhaps it's not over anger or hatred that he has for his wife. But Jesus says that even if you say raka, that you have murdered your brother in your heart, and, and many, many people think that Raka is like the harshest statement that Jesus says. There's, there's some early church um, commentaries that suggest that Raka is, is this subtle dismissal of someone. That you say Raka and you, you dismiss them. And if we, if we really see, man, our interpersonal interactions in that way, that that, that is something that when we say Raka and we you say, ah, like this person, and you get frustrated and irritable, and we dismiss them, right? And so easily, it happens all the time. But if we if we see that that is, that mars the image of Christ in us, and that mars the image of Christ in our communities, and so and so we can ask Mister J, hey, what what is this irritability you're feeling? Um, what what is another way that you can actually move towards your wife, even if she is wrong, is wronging you in some aspect of your of your marriage? How can you love her and move towards her? How can you serve her? And both before we move on to the last and most important of these three dimensions, again, we have the individual, we have the communal. I want, it's important to note that you know, we just talked about anger and loving your enemies. And that is good. And we, we should teach that and disciple others and lead others like Mr. J through irritability and say, no, how can you love? others instead of being irritable with them and even angry for the individual beatitudes we should say hey we should seek after these things we should be pure in heart and we should be merciful and hunger and thirst after righteousness but these the, the individual and the communal can only be accomplished if we have are we we are anchored in this third and final aspect of of the life of christ in the sermon on the mount and that his is his relationship with God the Father. In Matthew 6 and 7, we get to see the beauty of Jesus's relationship with his Father. And, and I, why is this important? And I love this Tozer quote. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Think about that. What comes into our minds when we think about God, like, we think about God, what's that first thing that pops into our mind? That that is the mo most important thing about us. And if we were to do this case study on the life of Jesus, what, did, what came to mind when Jesus thought of God? What came to mind is that God was his father. And he could come to him as a needy child. Throughout his whole life, he, he you know, says when he's facing persecution, he says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have hidden these things from the wise and understood and revealed them to helpless babes. He, his, his first response to God is a thankful heart to his father. In the Sermon on the Mount specifically, in Matthew chapter 6, he teaches us how to pray. Our Father who is in heaven. In Matthew chapter 7, he, he says you know, he really wanted to make sure that the people got it. And, and Jesus, in his wisdom, he taught in ways that made it sticky. And he looks at the crowd. Imagine, imagine the fathers in the crowd. 
he looks at the crowd and, and he says, which one of you, if his son asked for, for bread, would give him a stone? Or if he asked for a fish, would give him a serpent? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give good things to those who ask him? He is driving this point home that God is a father that gives good gifts to his children. You, if any of you have, have children and you imagine your, your daughter or your son coming to you and asking you for something, you're not going to push them away. You're not going to give, they're, if they're hungry, you're not going to give them a stone instead of bread. No, you're going to be thankful that they came to you and you're going to want to pour out what you have to provide for them. And this is what Jesus is teaching. This is, this is, his, this is his secret sauce that he has in his relationship with God. He came to him daily as a father and a son. He had a, he had a relational, not a transactional view of God. You know, okay, so how does this apply to biblical counseling? So many biblical counseling issues are at their core due to misconception about misconceptions about who God is. Another way of saying this is that many people believe lies about God's nature. You know, for some, God's sovereignty has been amply emphasized, while his, his nature as a father is, is distance. However, without understanding God's love as a father and coming to him and that being our core, it's so easy for shame to take root. And, and shame destroys people. This is the narrative that we see play out in the Garden of Eden, that they believed, Eve believed a lie about God. The serpent said, did God really say not to eat of that? And, and imagine, think what, what was turning in her mind? You know, did God really say? But previously to that, she had had a perfect union with her father. She was walking with God in the garden every day in the cool of the air. But when the serpent says, did God really say? All of a sudden, the thought that could have come to mind is like, wow, I thought God had my, had my best in, his, in mind. But perhaps he's withholding something from me. You know, this, this tree, why did he not want me to take of it? Is he, does he have a good thing that he actually doesn't want me to have? And so you, you see that it starts to turn, if that would start to turn in Eve's mind, all of a sudden her, her trust in, in her father would be, would be warped because she would see God now as someone that is against her and, and withholding something from her. And that's what leads to sh sin and shame and the brokenness that we see in this world. And even, okay, maybe that's too abstract. Yep. But I, I, I'm convinced that many people in modern days have a conception of God that's like a sentimental grandfather. He's distant. He, he's passive. Um, he congratulates you when you graduate, or he congratulates you when you get a new job or when you get married, but he's, he's largely uninvolved. That, that is not the God of the Sermon on the Mount. That's not, not the God that Jesus served. And that's not the God who we serve. And so you may be asking, how does this apply to Mr. J's case? What if we ask Mr. J, hey, where has God been in this situation? Was he distant? Um, perhaps, perhaps, do you think he was punishing you for a past sin? Um, you know, maybe Mr. J responds that, yeah, I he does have some of these thoughts. And if he's honest about it, he, he does feel like this disconnection from God is because he's viewing God in this way. Perhaps, you know, you can ask, where, where was God in this? Was he divinely orchestrating this, this, this thing to happen? You know, this, the miscarriage that happened five months ago. Perhaps Mr. J was told, hey, just trust God. God's got a plan for your life. This is all part of God's plan. That is a horrible view of God. When we're suffering God, and, and, and we're, we're experiencing loss and death in this world and sickness, ah, God's got a plan. That is not the God, that's, that's not the aspect of God that meets us in that moment. What meets us is that he mourns with us. Not that God is sovereign over death and that, ah, yes, he's, he, he's, he's accomplished this. And just trust him. Just trust him. No, the, God hates death. We can confidently say that. 
God hates it. And we, we see that in Jesus's life, particularly in Lazarus, when he, when he rose him from the dead. God hates death. And he, when, when that miscarriage happened, he was not on the opposite side of the equation from you, Mr. J, but he's on the same side with you. He's mourning with you. This is a thing that breaks God's world and he mourns with you. And the reason why I said previously why this aspect of this, this third dimension of, of relationship with the Father is so important, because this is what anchors the Beatitudes. If we do not know God's love as a Father and, and walk and abide in Him, then, how, then, then being poor in spirit, it's like, but why? It's, well, we're poor in spirit because we can come to Him as children and say, I'm needy and desperate, and turn to Him. Um, when, when it comes to loving our our neighbor as ourself. How can we love our neighbor if first we don't, our own way we view ourselves is broken, right? We don't see God's love for us first. How can we actually show love to others? And so this teaching actually anchors the other two. It anchors the Beatitudes and it anchors the way we live in community. You know, one, one challenge I give to each of you who are on this call. Next time you, you um, meet someone who's who's struggling. Ask them, hey, how how is God? How does God view you through all of this that's been happening? Where's where's God been in all of this? It's it's a bold question and one that not many people ask. I guarantee you will be shocked by the answers you get. You will be absolutely shocked, and you will be able to point them um, away from distortions and towards the truth. This is this is what gets me excited because one of the greatest privileges we have as counselors and exhorters in the church is that you get to undo the lies and the works of the devil by shining the light of God's love on their situation. And say something that's more exciting than that, that we can ask questions and, and probe and, and meet with someone and, and meet them in their suffering and say, you know, this is God, God is, God is here and he wants you to come to him. He loves you. Like to really, that is something we think about, but understanding God as a father is the core of how Jesus operated his entire life. You just read the gospel of John with this in mind and you'll see it. It's everywhere. And, and as counselors, we get to point others towards that and, and allow them to, to walk in that same abiding relationship that Christ showed that he taught in the Sermon on the Mount and then he showed in his life. So some final remarks. This is by no means a exhaustive or comprehensive um, framework for biblical counseling, but it is a starting place. Trust between when, anytime there's a counseling relationship, trust is the cru is is crucial. You can have this framework, but if you don't have trust and a loving relationship, um, then nothing is going to land. And so the ways to build trust is listen with curiosity. Um, it's surprisingly difficult to be curious in a relationship and to really ask questions and, and put yourself in their shoes. Because it, it, it's mentally taxing to, to keep yourself there and, and, and wonder and kind of poke and prod. Hey, you said this. What did you mean by that? Um, I noticed you, you, you said this. Do you think, really think that's true? And, and kind of poking and prodding and a part of listening with curiosity also requires asking bold questions. Um, but if we have that trust built, this is a, a way in which we can lean in as counselors. And you may not even view yourself as a counselor. Maybe you, you know, I don't have the gift of shepherding and this is not something that I do in my community, but I, I'd imagine there's times in your life when people come to you and they, they're struggling and they're asking for advice. You're operating as a counselor in that take, in that moment. Um, and so, so take heart uh, you there, there are tools you have. And as, as you live your own Christian life and abide in Christ and live out the Sermon on the Mount, that is something that you can bring others into. Um, and I just want to offer some resources for the lay counselor um, or the non-professional. First, uh, again, I want just know your role in, in when people are struggling. Um, if there are impairments and people are struggling to where they're unable to work or even interact in community and you're, you're really noticing like, man, something deeper is going on. Um, know that, Hey, if you're uncomfortable with the situation, then trust that. And, and know that 
professional mental health workers are your partners. They're not your enemies and that you could actually work with them and there can be a, a synergistic relationship. Um, I, I really recommend this resource uh, from mentalhealthgateway.org backslash four Rs. This is a, a two hour free training session for, for pastors um, to, to recognize the signs of mental illness and know when to refer to professionals. And so it's free. Um, I recommend it to many people. And it's just a great way to educate and inform yourself and appreciate um, the consequences of mental illness and, and how to how to meet those people, but then also how to um, how and when to to know when to refer to professionals. Thank you. That, that concludes this talk. All right. Thank you, Brother Seth. <clears throat> you did a really good job at providing a a framework to approach um, the people that we interact with in our lives. Um, to view the Sermon on the Mount as therapy is a beautiful thing. Um, I'm excited to think of it that way and to think of the effect that this can have in our lives and in those we care about. So God bless you for sharing with us this morning. Thank you so much. I am going to open it up for for questions. So go ahead and unmute yourselves and feel free to talk. Um, but I have a one question to start off with. I had to think about the processes that are going on in a person's mind if they sit down. And I appreciate that you brought out the gut level honesty with ourselves and with God and how difficult that actually is. Um, speaking from experience, I know there's many times in my life, and it's actually been a process to get to that level of, of honesty um, between myself and myself and between me and God. And it is something that we have to, to work at to get there. And it, by the aid of the Holy Spirit, we truly can. But to start with that, and then to think of, you know, what does poverty and spirit look like? What does mourning look like? I, lo I love that encouragement there. Um, I was talking to a friend uh, quite a while ago, and we were talking about the emotional baggage and, um, you know, things that we can accumulate in life through experiences and things that affect us um, emotionally. And she said that the Holy Spirit can heal in a second what sometimes it could take us years to try to work through, you know, in our minds. Um, how does how does a comment like that? Or what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a great question. I will never be the one to limit what the Holy Spirit can do in a moment. From testimonies that I've heard from my own life, I know that things that happened to us in our past the brokenness in this world, the things that we experienced that we didn't even want, they have, they have ways of like sinking their claws into us. And, and, and to undo that, it, um, I'm hesitant to give a blanket statement as this is how it happens, right? Yeah. Um, some people, I think a radical transformational experience um, can be can be the means by which they they overcome. But for many people, it's going to take time and loving community and mm -hmm. uh, people that can speak in and, and, and pour in and oftentimes um, even professional help, depending on the on the situation. And, and so I'm, I'm very hesitant about giving like saying anything dogmatically about that. But I know from my own experience that the Holy Spirit, um, when we when we experience the adoption as sons and daughters of the living God, it, it plants us in new soil, right? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden our roots start going, going into new soil where in the past it was going into sin. And, and that has a way of secondarily healing a lot of the traumatic things we've experienced in the past. Um, but again, I think for most, I, I, I will say for this, for most people, it is going to take time and it's going to take loving community um, and even closer, closer relationships than that. So it's a great question though. Yeah, it's 
I, I thinking about these things from, you know, strictly a, a secular standpoint, it seems like there's so much, you know, time and effort and all of these things that need to go in, not saying it doesn't in the Christian sense as well, but we introduce an element of the creator um, to this. Like when you think of going to the Sermon on the Mount as a basis for biblical counseling, you're introducing the heavenly father that you talked about. You're introducing um, the source of life, the source of, so it's, it's beautiful to think about helping people deal with their trauma and introducing them to the heavenly father that created them and um, the healing that can come from that. Not saying that there might be, you know, an illness in their mind that would take further treatment to take care of, but it's, it's, it's beautiful to think about. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. One other what thing that could be helpful with that, the subject is there's a, a psychiatrist in Canada, her name's Nadine Nidis. Um, she, she's a Christian and she works with primarily pastors and Christian leaders in her, and she's over like, you know, 20 pastors a week in her clinical practice. And one of her observations that she made was that, you know, especially in like Western Christianity and in America and Canada today, so much of, of the faith we have reduced to what she calls the left brain faith. And the left brain is more the analytical, the logical, the, okay, this is true. So this is true. So this is true. I just need to think about that. And she says, oftentimes what, what happens, especially when dealing with our past is, is that's not enough. And, and so she talks about how we need to integrate the right brain and the right brain is the more intuitive and expansive and the, the side of our brain that actually connects our mind to our, our body. And it's a little bit um, rudimentary, but it, her, her point in saying that is that she wants to call Christians away from just thinking the right things, but also like experiencing and knowing God and, and that emo the emotional aspect. I think emotions can get a lot of slack among, amongst Christians, but emotions are from God. Like when we, the highs and lows of life, they're, they're emotions that Jesus experienced. And so they're not wrong. And so um, she has different um, meditative practices where you know, she walks people through just reading through a Psalm, Psalm 103, that we, you, you would sit for, for 20 minutes and think about how, how high God's love is, how wide it is. And really, you know, we can think about that and I can just say that right there, but to really let that sit in. Um, and become a core of who, who we are. I think integrating more of that like, right brain the way in the way we think about a holistic faith um, can also help um, help us overcome and work through past experiences that perhaps haunt us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very helpful. Is there anyone with comment or questions? Uh, Matthew, uh, Seth, you you spoke about uh, a couple of of uh, thinking patterns. Um, you you mentioned that Mr. J might think the world and God is against us, and then you also referred to Eve might have thought, well, God may not, uh, um, God may be withholding uh, something good from from me. Do you have any thoughts on? Uh, on how to work with default thinking patterns that have been entrenched for years and years and years. Yeah, that's a great question, Noah. Um, thank you for asking it. Yeah, there, there are many approaches to that, to that question. And how do we, how do we, retrain in a sense or reconfigure our, our patterns of thought that like you said are in, become entrenched over time um, you know I, I just mentioned this previously but you know our thought patterns are often have this unique interplay with with our both our past and then our like emotions and the way we feel and just like our our temperament some people have a temperament that's just more depressed and more negative um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. And so if, if people find themselves in that and then find themselves in the rigid patterns of thought, um, 
feeling like the world the world is against them or that God is against them. They're yeah, they're seeing, seeing using those three frameworks, right? There's the, I would actually start with the social and the communal. Like God, it says in First John that if anyone walks in the light as he is in the light, that we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. And so there's, there's a promise there that it, as we walk in the light with Christ, that we'll have fellowship with one another. And God has a way of unleashing truth and grace into our lives through community. And so I'd say for step one to that person, I would I would ask what their community looks like and what their church looks like. And do they have people who are walking with them and checking in on them about these thought patterns and and being honest with, hey, this is how I'm thinking about God. And and so just that just having that within community where you're talking about those things and people know about it is a it's a good first step. Um, and then there's but there's there's the there's the thought itself. Um, obviously those that's that recognizing, Hey, that's the thought, but that's also not what I believe. Right. Like I know that's not who God is. And, and so you want to like bring those together and like integrate those, right? Like what you believe and what you're thinking. And that, that also takes time and it, there's many tools. And I, I would say meditating on, on God's word, not just memorizing, but meditating on it, like sitting on it. And, and like I said, with Psalm 103, like, allowing those words to just wash over who you are daily. Um, and, and those are spiritual disciplines, right, that we have through prayer and scripture reading. I'd say that that that's a that's a piece of the puzzle. Um, and there is also the aspect, and I don't think this is talked about enough, that Jesus, it says in Hebrews that he was he, in the days of his flesh, offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears, and he was heard because of his reverence. And there's something about, and we mentioned this being honest before God and coming coming to him and saying, God, this is like what I'm struggling. This is like, this, is, this thought pattern, is, it feels like it has me enslaved. And really crying out, allowing our, emo- like our heart to just sit before God in that and being honest and saying, God, I want to I change these patterns. It's a way of being poor in spirit, right? And, and coming to him in that way. But oftentimes we play whack-a-mole instead. We say, no, I don't want to do this. I don't want to have this thought. But instead coming to God f- from that starting place and and really being honest with him, like, man, these are my thoughts and I want to retrain that and, and cry out to him. It's also a, a starting place. And then there's also helpful like work workbooks. And, you know, I, I have a, so the, the, so community, spiritual disciplines, um, and then what it looks like to be poor in spirit. And also with my psychiatric background and interest in psychiatry, I, I'm not opposed. And I think it's, it's great if we use workbooks that um, secular therapists use. I, I recommend them all the time to people because they're not in competition with faith, but they just they help us give us tools on how to how to how to how our thinking patterns tend to progress. Um, and the, so there's a few workbooks. Uh, acceptance commitment therapy. You can get a workbook on that. Cognitive behavioral therapy. You can get a workbook on that. And it'll just have exercises where you track your thoughts for a day. And then and then you kind of notice trends. And so there's helpful exercises from just a practical standpoint that I also recommend for people that struggle. Can I ask a question? Yes. You did a great job of presentation. I really enjoyed your information. Is this a what you presented or what we're presenting right now, is this an in-reach kind of therapy or an outreach? In-reach being within our community, outreach would be people on the street. That's a great question, Patrick. <laughs> if you remember that my, my slide on, on biblical counseling, um, the definition was that it is discipleship for the problems of every complex, complex problems of everyday life and discipleship can only be done within the context of the local church. Um, and, and so does it, does it mean the sermon on the Mount is not true for those who were doing outreach? No, it's just, as true, but, but these things can only be lived out by someone who 
um, is for, who first knows God and, and, and comes to him and, and is born again um, and walks with him and then is in community. Um, and so it doesn't, but it doesn't mean like if someone doesn't know God and they, they want to be, they want to love their enemies. It doesn't mean they can't do that. People love their enemies all the time. Right. Um, but the full, the fullness of these teachings is for the person in the context of a local church. Um, and that's, that's the basis by which we counsel, right. By the, the shared principles that we have. And so if we go, go to someone, they don't share these same principles about, you know, who God is and what the world is like. And so there's going to be a disconnect there. Second part to that. What if you're an outreach church that doesn't reach into the community, but reaches out to the community where there's a lot of wreckage? You don't have to answer that. You can send me an email. <laughs> I'm not trying to suck up the time. Thanks, Patrick. Could you could you put your email in the chat? We can get you his email, yeah. uh, Brother Seth. Thanks. Yeah. I have a question. So what would you recommend when, when we think of, I know this, is an outward reaching idea. But when we think of people that have gone through hard things in life and rejected God because of those hard things and how they view God, would this be a starting point for reaching those people? Like maybe they don't even want help, but I wonder if this con changing their concept of God would be a helpful way to start. Um, I appreciated your folk, how you brought out how God is not the one who's bringing these hard things into our life. Um, I noticed in the, in the first, verses of the Sermon on the Mount there, uh, the words like comfort, inherit, filled, obtain, see, and called, those are all actions that God is enabling. And I'm wondering, is that a good starting point to help those people? Yeah, amen. Thanks, Brother Darren. It's a great question. So yeah, I want to I clarify what I said previously, that this, what I offered is the, this Sermon on the Mount as a biblical counseling framework that is for the church. It's for the it's it's for discipling within the context of our, our church communities. But these truths are are true. Right? <laughs> God God is this way. God is the Father. Like the beatitudes are true. If we, if we are poor in spirit and come to Him, the kingdom of heaven is ours. And so, it is a way of engaging others that do have these wounds. And 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 like you said, people that grow up in a in the Christian faith and then and then leave. So much of it is, it is this, this, this core wound, something that happened, right? And seeing the Beatitudes, like you said, like those, that, those verbs are so powerful because it, it shows that God is, wants to meet us in the midst of whatever happened and that he's not against us. He's not on the other side of the equation, um, like I said previously. And I, I think I, I would pro I'll probably need maybe more context on what the specific um, wound that that person has to, to speak more to it. But I do think the Sermon on the Mount, especially the Beatitudes and knowing God as a, a loving father are great starting places for engaging with those people that are hardened of heart. Seth. Um. You mentioned that you're interested in, in psychiatry. I'm curious to know uh, what part, if any, uh, the great fathers of psychiatry place in your thought, that being Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung. It's, it's a great question, Dan. So this is, how much time do we have? Because to really unpack <laughs> Freud and Jung might take a minute. Uh, I'll I'll give you the I'll just give you the, try to give you the, the two minute. So so Freud is the father of psychoanalytic thought. Um, his his thought his in the 1940s his thoughts came to America and really took over in American psychiatry, and have the the way we understand the the subconscious or the unconscious or that the problems that we deal with are due to our like childhood conflicts that weren't resolved. Those are, those are Freudian thoughts. And a lot of what Freud viewed around like the Oedipus co complex and these relationships between father, son, mother, son, people have moved away from, but there's still aspects that 
um, in modern psychology are very much alive and, and useful at times. And so for, for me, interested in, in being interested in psychiatry, I, I see, I don't, I don't see psychology as like a competing thing with my faith and my theology. I actually see them as separate. I, I, I see psychology as a discipline that observes people from a very specific scientific lens. But then my interpretive structure over all of that is my view of God in the world. And so when I see people like, like Freud, but then Jung, Jung especially, because Freud and Jung, their big um, disagreement, because they were, they were very close, but they, they disagreed on how to view religion. Jung was more sympathetic to religion because he said, Freud was like, no, religion is the neurosis of the masses. It's just keeping people blind. But Jung said, no, religion, uh, we see these stories and these arcs in religion that we can learn from. Um, and, and his work on archetypes. And, and Jordan Peterson, a, a popular psychologist today, um, he's actually very influenced by Jung and a lot of Jung's ideas. And, and a lot of them do have a place within life. It, it's, it shouldn't become our operating worldview, but they, they become tools by which we can view this one aspect of, of life. But again, I keep my, my, my view of God in the world as my overarching um, framework, but I, I do see a lot of value in, in some of their findings. Yeah, that's good. I don't know if that um, is a controversial take. <laughs> I think it's helpful um, to hear you say that. I mean, I feel like there's a lot of, we all have ideas about psychology and they've been shaped by a lot of sometimes misinformed areas and perspectives and so it's it's fascinating to me and I know I've talked I've talked to you about these things before how from your perspective as a in working in psychology how the community uh, the, the element of community in in the kingdom um, provides so much um, for an individual like you were when you were answering answering a question earlier you know, to start with community and how so much of our minds, we, we can feed in on ourselves. And so if you go, if you emphasize community where there's other people putting, having input into how we're thinking in our thought processes and our patterns and um, habits, how that's extremely helpful when we're surrounded by godly people who can, who can have input into how our minds are, are handling things. I think it's awesome. <clears throat> well um i think unless I someone has a burning question um, I mean, or do you have a comment one more comment on, on dan your question uh, just for people that are interested in church history uh, justin martyr his first apology is a is a great early church source of looking like how did these early church men view philosophy and psychology um Justin Martyr was a, a Platonist, and he converted to Christianity. And he actually kept his, his philosopher garb and robe on because he saw Christianity as the one true philosophy. Um, I mean, so, and then you have Paul in Acts 17. He, he quotes Ep Epimenides, who is a, a, a philosopher from uh, the 7th century BC. Uh, and he quotes a poem around Zeus to talk about God. And, and so you, there's, there's examples of you know, we don't need to pit these things against one another, but we can actually see see what other people are noticing in light of of the ultimate reality that we have in Christ. So. Yeah, that's good. Um, I think we will we'll wrap this up here. Uh, thank you all for sticking around this I long. Quick, yes, go I ahead. Quick, would anybody know of some resource? Um, book or like a work uh, workbook on the Sermon on the Mount that would open up these three concepts more kind of in the angle of what was presented this morning. I personally don't know of one. Um, I don't know if anyone else does. I guess that's a project we should we should get going on. It would be helpful. I think it would. It's. Uh, I really appreciated how what was opened this morning, but 
if we, if we just more in depth the different parts of the Sermon on the Mount and applying it like right. it was this morning. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that suggestion. I think it would be um, very helpful. Yeah, I think that will be it for us this morning. Uh, thank you, Brother Seth, for coming on and sharing those insights. Um, it has It's exhilarating to think about the provisions that God has provided for us um, in the teachings of Christ. And we do have all we need. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. Um, so thank you. God bless you for your humility and honesty in sharing this morning. And um, we will have a prayer and then I will make an announcement. Would you close us in prayer, Brother Seth? Absolutely. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are a great and awesome God. Lord, from you are you are before time and you are after our time. Um, you are you have no end, and you with the perfection and the completion that you have in yourself of you and your son and your spirit and the, the fullness of life that you that you are, and, and that you offer the that we can partake in this abundant life that you have. Um, and we can partake of it through community. We can partake of it through the glories of your church and your saints. We can partake of it through your word and through your teachings, Lord Jesus. Um, that we can that we can grow and cultivate a life of the kingdom here on earth. That is, there is the riches of that are are unfathomable, Lord. And so I, I pray that um, the things that have been shared here, that your word would just come to life in a new way in our hearts and minds. Um, that we would go out and bear much fruit for your name. Uh, we love you. We worship you today. Um, and we, we proclaim that you are worthy of it all. Um, I pray this in the name of your son. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So on March, March 11th, we will meet again, same time, same place, 6 o'clock Eastern time. Um, Brother Paul Garber from New York, Rochester, New York, I believe, is going to be sharing on reading Paul through first century eyes. So you're all welcome back again, uh, six o'clock in the morning, March 11th, to hear that talk. Thank you for joining us today. Um, it's been wonderful to have you all here with us. Um, go with God and um, God bless you all. As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend.